My name is John Fronmeyer. I am a board member and legal counsel for Direct Action Everywhere. I first became vegan in 2009. What led up to it was I'd done a yoga teacher training program in my early 20s, and then I just saw, I would just watched a lot of things online and had a conversation with someone about the dairy industry and, and realized that I just didn't want to contribute to animal exploitation in, in anything, in any of my consumer behavior. You know, to be honest, I don't know that I experienced a huge difference. I became vegan kind of over a long period of time. I was veg I became vegetarian when I was 21 and vegan three years later. And I think I've always tried to uh, maintain a pretty healthy lifestyle even, even before I went vegan. So to be honest, I didn't, I, don't, I haven't noticed a huge physical difference. But uh, what I can say is that every year that I've been an animal rights activist, I've become more and more committed to the cause and I've become more and more aware of just how urgent a, a moral and, uh, and, and health and environmental issue uh, animal rights is. We're at a point in civilization where we're just, we are driving ourselves off a cliff, but we're not the ones who are going to go off the cliff first. It's all of the animals in, in the environment and all of the animals who are in the custody of other human beings uh, right now. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're in this kind of perpetual moral crisis, this perpetual atrocity that is also going to destroy all of us. And so I think what we have to realize is that we, we have a duty to stand up and fight for these animals. You know, civilization is going to collapse if we don't do it. And I think we have to realize that's the truth and, and we have to act accordingly, whether we like it or not. I think it's really important for other people to be vegan, to show solidarity with the animals and temporarily put ourselves in opposition to the industries that are exploiting animals. And I think it's really important to go vegan so that you are not personally beholden to this industry and you can kind of stand back and see it for what it is and see it as this entire monolith that needs to be dismantled. It certainly, it can feel isolating and at first you know, I was fortunate to be around people who, like roommates, coworkers, who didn't necessarily see animals the same way that I did, but at least respected it. And so I never really had to deal with like ostracization or anything like that, which I think is an issue for a lot of people. But I, but it still can be can feel isolating, and it still feels like you're the odd one out. And so what I would say is most important for people is just find communities of like-minded people, um, people where you can let your guard down and feel vulnerable and feel like you can talk about animals, you can talk about the way that you eat, the way that we think about animals socially and politically, economically, and, and feel at ease. And then I think that we can have those communities just be a, a home base from which we can then venture out into the world and start getting victories for, for the animals and changing society to be compassionate and, and loving toward them. You know, what I find to be most effective is talking about my experiences actually going inside of factory farms and slaughterhouses because that's not something that a lot of people have ever even seen, much less actually done. And so I, I'm fortunate to have had these experiences, some of which resulted in felony charges. And that's actually something else that I would often talk about. I, this is especially true when I did an investigation of Smithfield in 2017 that resulted in four felony charges and 60 years potentially in, in prison and just telling people that I was facing that all for uh, removing two piglets who were probably going to die inside of this massive factory farm in Utah just like was so outside of people's experiences that it just sort of would make them stop for a second. 
And so that, that's one reason why we, why we do challenge the, the legal system is we want to show these extreme, totally not intuitive results from doing certain actions so that people can see how bad things are for, for the animals. And um, with any luck, that can be a, an impetus for them to change and then join the side of, of the liberationists. With regard to, to family and friends, it, it's very challenging, and I, I don't know that I'm al I've always been the most compassionate communicator with my family because I tend to just be very, very honest. There aren't a lot of people where I can be like, yes, this person is an animal rights believer because of, of me, but there are key moments that I, I think that I've contributed to as far as moving people along in their consciousness. What's been effective is showing people what I've actually seen and what, what we've documented inside of factory farms and slaughterhouses. Because when people realize that this is the reality, it changes their, their thinking in a, in a way that's a lot more profound than me just describing it or communicating to them that this is a really important issue to me. When they can actually see it with their own eyes, then I, th I think that is, that's a very, very powerful step in terms of changing consciousness. Mm, yeah, I mean, I regret not getting involved in activism sooner. I regret not doing more activism and not not being more aggressive and not being more bold. You know, it's uh, certainly like it's something that I'm all of us can strive to get better at things and find exactly where we fit into the movement. I think what I try to do is look back at the regrets and then use those as templates of, for how to move forward with activism and just doing, doing more to change the world for animals. I honestly didn't really think of animal rights as a social justice issue for a very long time. Even if I became vegan, my general thinking was animal exploitation, I should say, was something that I personally didn't want to participate in, but it never even occurred to me that society itself could change or that if it did, it might take 500 years or, or 1,000 years. But I, I give a lot of credit to the author of Boycott Veganism, someone by the name of Wayne Chung, who wrote this essay titled that, that basically argued that we should look at animal rights as a social justice issue and we should expect that our actions could contribute to society, to effectuating this massive pull shift in society where people go from thinking and behaving in one way to thinking and behaving in the exact opposite way in a relatively short amount of time, like 30 or 40 years. And then when I, as soon as I started thinking about that, I realized that it was true that we could just look at animal rights the same way that we've looked at marriage equality or civil rights or so many other issues. And, uh, and, and try and actually affect a change in society. I didn't realize it was a priority. I, I remember first hearing about veganism when I was 15. My debate coach in high school said that he was a vegan and I thought it was extreme, but there was something about it that seemed true also. And it was just one of those things where we, we hear things and it, they just sort of go to the back of the mind and we don't really act on them until some later later point. So for me, it was just I needed to he I needed more reference experiences in the world to confirm that there was truth, that there was something very real there. Yeah, I probably I did think that. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah, I think when I first heard it, it was it was too outside of my own experience for me to, to, you know, to take really seriously. So yeah, I definitely did think that. Yeah, I would say my staples are uh, like tempeh. Um, really love tempeh. And I like to make, uh, you know, tempeh sandwiches with like kale and tomatoes and, uh, and avocado. And uh, I, I really like lentils. I really like garbanzo, any sort of Indian uh, cooking is like, amazing in my book. I love like turmeric and coriander and all the different spices. So, um, and I try to eat uh, vegetables every day. Like I said, kale and other leafy greens. I try to eat some fruit. 
Uh, I try and fail to not eat sugar and candy. I still have a sweet tooth, but working on phasing that stuff out because I really I do think that nutrition plays a pretty huge role in how we experience the world and how happy we are and how productive we are and energetic. So I do think it's really important. I would suggest others find uh, first uh, communities of, of people who are plant-based and do have an animal rights consciousness. And from there, it's usually pretty easy to find restaurants or grocery stores that, uh, that suit your nutritional uh, requirements and preferences. You know, get involved in activism too, because I think it's really important to remind ourselves of why we ultimately do this and realize that there are just a class of beings who really need our help. And I think it's good to, to center them and everything that we do, and it enables us to be stronger in our convictions. Yeah, I guess with regard to nutrition, I think like Dr. Greger is really good. Uh, Jack Norris is really good. I've definitely learned things from him. You know, animal rights goes more generally. I would just say try, you know, just learn as much you, as you can about what's going on you know, what the industry is doing and see, see kind of what, where your interests and skill sets lie. Do you, does the idea of meeting with lawmakers and trying to pass animal rights legislation appeal to you? Do you want to run for office yourself and try to be a leader in a legislature or in an executive branch somewhere? Do you like doing undercover investigations, uh, uh, just trying to mobilize, do community organizing and mobilization? So, you know, there are a whole bunch of different ways that people can succeed and sometimes we have to bounce around and try and fail at things before we find what we are ultimately good at. I'm still right there. Yeah, organizations that I think are really valuable, I would say uh, DXE, uh, the group I've done most of my organizing with because we really encourage and em empower people to step outside of their comfort zones and the dream really is to mobilize thousands of people and just create these nonviolent armies that can go, I, I say army, but they're, they're nonviolent. Like the idea is to intervene, to stop violence from, from happening directly on the, the quote unquote front lines. So the, the slaughterhouses and the, the factory farms. And I think that's a key, that's going to be a key driver for, for changing social norms. Um, or, but any sanctuary, um, Farm Sanctuary, Rancho Compasión. I mean, there's so many different, uh, you know, folks who are doing amazing work because once we actually do liberate these animals, once people's purchasing habits change, we're going to need to have massive space for all these beings who've previously been confined and tortured and mutilated, and they're going to need a safe and loving home. And so all the people who are working in sanctuaries and who are starting to, to build this new world are doing such amazing and valuable work. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, support, I support any organization that is trying to make our world more compassionate and peaceful for non-human animals. And there's a whole bunch of different ones out there for people's various preferences. Yeah, for cl clarification, DXE is short for direct action everywhere. We actually used to have an FAQ on why it was DXE and not DAE, like what that X means there's sort of like a math math nerd component to it because like DX is like the symbol for a derivative and calculus and the idea is that we think that animal rights is is becoming more and more mainstream and that society is changing and we want to increase the rate of change like the derivative if you will of societal change for animals that's what the DX means. Yeah, uh, website is, you can do dxe.io or you can do direct action everywhere, all written out.com. That's a good question. I, you know, I haven't honestly talked to a lot of ex-vegans. In a few cases I've known about, it's just when uh, people kind of build their lives with others who are not vegan and don't have an animal rights consciousness. And the thing, the thing about it is, is that it is something that's easy to lose in mainstream society because mainstream society is, has speciesism so deeply rooted in it. It's like everywhere. You just walk down the street and you just see advertisements of 
food that is made from the body parts of, of like tortured animals. And it's just so, it, it just inculcates in, in your mind in such a profound way. And it's, I think, easy to fall back and, and forget about the animals if you are not in a community that can kind of resist the, the social pressure that's coming at, at us from every angle of society. We need people to remind us of, of why we're doing this in the first place. Sure, yeah. I, so my, my mom, I would say, is a success story, bless her heart. You know, when we used to talk about animal rights and open rescue and veganism, she was, she, she was very hesitant and very, uh, very concerned about it, uh, mostly because of, like, legal risks that, that people might run into if they were trying to, to rescue animals. And, uh, she, and just over time, she became very compelled by the videos and the photos that we took inside of animal exploitation facilities, especially Circle 4 in Smithfield. I showed her the, the photos that we took and she saw the video footage of just like row after row after row of mother pig in crates where they couldn't even turn around. And just a few months ago, her, my mom's sister reached out and said, I want to have dinner with you all and I'm going to bring a body of a pig over. And my mom actually put her foot down and said, no, like I'm drawing a line at pigs. They're, they're too intelligent and I've seen what this industry does to them and I don't want to support it. And my mom re really likes, um, can you, like she just likes uh, agreeableness like she wants to be friends with other people. So for her to make this such a, such a strong statement to her own family member was really powerful. And so I'm proud of that. No, no. I mean, I like if I ha voluntarily, no, I would not. If I had to, I mean, I'm not a purist in the sense that my view is that like we should be stopping violence against animals and if i were in a situation where i felt like my action was would be necessary to to preserve my own life but wouldn't in any way contribute to violence against another being i don't know that i would that i would necessarily avoid it but that like it's a very extreme uh hypothetical scenario that i think is unlikely to happen in life so Short answer is no. If I weren't an animal rights activist, I'd probably be a drug policy activist because that's the other issue that I'm really, really passionate about in life. So like when I was in on the Oregon Law Review, I put on a symposium about drug policy in Oregon. This is back in 2013. And I just think there's, we need so much consciousness raising on that issue as well because we just have this deeply punitive, you know, police, prison, state, and we've been absolutely wrecking people's lives for the last 40 plus years and wrecking lives of people all, all over the world, including in South and Central America. So we gotta, we gotta do something about that too. Like I could talk all day long about drug policy too. It was Tolstoy's quote, so long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. Uh, there's Chief Seattle's uh, quote, I guess like late 19th century, I think, that said that uh, an like the, a the animals are our brothers and sisters and we only eat them because we have to. Uh, I think that's a really powerful quote because I think our world is different today. We don't actually have to, to kill animals at all. And so let's just, we can just take the first part. Animals are our brothers and sisters and we don't have to hurt them. I think the most important thing for people to think about is, is the spiritual component of animal rights activism, like how much room human beings have to evolve and how amazingly beautiful this world can be if we start seeing our non-human animals as our fellow earthlings and we start being loving and compassionate to all of them and just seeing how their consciousness could, could just grow and, and, and flourish and what they could teach us and like we think about like there are animals that I think that are smarter than human beings like dolphins and 
elephants, or at least like they have these like extraordinary mental capacities, but we just, human beings, we just don't study them. We don't interact with them. And in a lot of places, those animals are, are hunted and, and killed and like the Faroe Islands and, and stuff. So like, there's just, there's an, like, on the one hand, we're just doing these, it, we're, what we're doing to animals is destroying the planet and destroying us. And on the other hand, we have such an incredible opportunity to build a better future if we can change our relationship to non-human animals. And, I, and we're just going to develop spiritually so much and our understanding of consciousness is going to make quantum leaps forward. I think it's possible. I think it's very, very possible. I, I, you know, the future is just not written. I don't know if it's inevitable or not. Uh, I, I know some people think that it is, but I, I, I don't necessarily think it's inevitable. I think it's possible that like society 2000 years from now could be worse with regard to how people deal with non-human animals. I hope it will be better, a, a lot better. And I, ho I hope it will be that what we do will be completely gone in the next several decades. Uh, I think it's going to take, uh, uh, it's just going to take a lot of organizing and it's, got, it's gonna take a lot of people who are willing to step outside of their comfort zone and stand true to their convictions. So I got started with DXD actually because I met the co-founder, uh, one co-founder, Wayne Shung, at uh, the law firm where, where I started and then where Wayne started after moving over to California from Chicago. And that was back in summer of 2012. And then DXD got started a few months after that, and I did my very first action in January of 20, my very first action, I don't know what an action even was, but we, we just went to a grocery store in Portland and did a poem and, and a speak out. And I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. This is more radical than, than I've been used to. And uh, yeah, and then I, I uh, went to work at the law firm in California for a few years, but I would still come up on the weekends and hang out at the DXC house in Oakland. And then I quit my job in January of 2017 and immediately went and did our Circle 4 Norbest investigations right after that and moved to Berkeley. And I've just been part of the community ever since. Yeah, so I, I have been inside of two slaughterhouses. Uh, like strictly slaughterhouses. Uh, one was uh, Ming's Live Poultry, and that was in May of 2017 as part of the DXC Forum. And then we did another action at Saba Live Poultry in October of 2017. And then those were the two times that I actually went inside of a slaughterhouse where they were actually in the process of killing non-human animals. and. Uh, it was, it, it's a really like, it, it's a really traumatic thing to do because you want to save everyone who's there, like realistically, that's just logistically next to impossible. And so you have to live with the fact that you can make a difference only for some and that others are gonna continue to be, to be brutalized. Yeah, it's a really hard environment to be in for people. And I, I, I and that was, I mean, I was part of a large group both times and a lot of people were crying and became extremely emotional. And I certainly felt the injustice of that environment too. And I just wish that, that we could do more. And I'm sure we'll, we'll be back and we just need more groups of people to get together and, um, and go inside of these places and try and provide whatever help we can and intervene nonviolently in whatever way we can. It is the kind of thing where if you do, if you are conscious of, of, of these other beings and you don't want to see them hurt, it's, it's just so unbelievably gut-wrenching and so saddening that these kinds of places exist. And it's hard to deal with because there's so many of them and so few of us, uh, so many of them meaning so many places like that, and there's so many beings who need help and it's, uh, it's just sad knowing, knowing that, that that's happening and that we can only intervene to save a few. But it, I think it strengthens one's resolve also, and it helps uh, inspire us to create a world where those places don't exist. 
and where hopefully future generations are never going to be in the position that we're in, where we have this constant moral dilemma of wanting to help so many beings, but just not being able to. And I want future generations of human beings to not have to experience that. I want them to just relax and breathe and enjoy being on Earth and knowing that everyone is being cared for and that there aren't human beings who are doing bad things who we have to spend our time trying to stop, frankly. It's really hard. I don't like being in opposition with other human beings. I wish we could all just get along and build this world together. And I hope that if even a lot of these people who are running these places can come to the same conclusion eventually. But for now, these places do exist and we've just got to find a way to stop them. It depends on the role. Uh, some people are going in to document conditions. Some people are going in to negotiate with the owners. Some people are going in to uh, negotiate with law enforcement. Some people are going in to be legal observers. And some people are going in to try to rescue. I don't know if I said that, but some people are going in with a specific goal of, of finding animals who are in particular need, maybe animals who are being criminally abused and try to take them to safety somewhere. I don't know that I actually set foot inside of Ming's. I think I was with a group of people that, who were outside. I did go into Saba, though, and I was just a, a legal observer. And I, I also had agreed to do civil disobedience, so I refused to leave, and then I was cited and released by the Oakland Police Department after that. So that's actually another important role, is if, if you're going to do it as civil disobedience, and I, should, I don't even necessarily want to call it civil disobedience because I actually think that we're acting in accordance with the law, but we do know that, that cops uh, will see it differently and there's a very good chance that we'll be asked to leave unjustly or even illegally. And so it can be helpful uh, to be willing beforehand to go to jail. There are a lot of different types of animals they kill at Saba. And I, I just remember seeing rows and rows of birds who were just all crammed inside of these small cages. And it's just it's this really bizarre, sad thing. It's like you're looking at these condemned, these condemned beings who shouldn't, who shouldn't be condemned. They did, they did nothing wrong, but they're going to experience this violent fate for no good reason.